Hi, how's it going? This is Resident of Column for YouTube, and I'm here to read To Be Night and Beguile, written by John Philip Betancourt, Chapter 9, The Ghost of Sabrina Lord. Hey, Tommy here to get scary. <laughs> A morning fog choked the sound of the waves washing on the small beach of the small Satow Island on the southern edge of Welshport. On Good Island, as the locals called it, named after its one inhabitant, Mary Good's mysterious hermit mother, Eliza, was pacing back and forth in her small cottage, causing a creaking back and forth sound on the old wooden panels that covered her floor. The warmth of a fire beamed a blanket of air that circulated within the damp cool of the morning light inside the house. Eliza was boiling a tea of camel and jasmine the calm, anxious body her but had yet to sip any. She only stared down at the steaming mug her mind in so many places at once. She was worried about what had happened at the wedding. She was worried about her own book of spells and hexes was telling her. She was worried about the future, most of all, how her daughter Mary was the cause of so much of the tension the universe was sending, tangled up in the web of Jacob Lord's creation. Then suddenly, a frantic knock on her door. Eliza jumped in her skin and turned violently towards the noise, spilling her tea in the process. The scolding hot tea burned her hand. The skin. It burned her. The skin began to form a web. Oh, sorry, a welt. But then Eliza covered it with her free hand, and then. She removed it. The welt was gone. Eliza's breathing shallowed as her hand magically healed. The warmth and hollow face tensed as the knocking turned to pounding. Mother! Mary's voice screamed from the other side. Eliza broke from her frozen stance and dashed to the wooden door, lifting the long beam lock that had dropped across it. He pulled open the door where her daughter was standing completely, a mess from a long night hiding in the western woods of Welshport Island from authorities who were causing, oh sorry, who were chasing her with dogs all through the night once she vanished from Terramore House. I've done something horrible, and, and dear God, Mother, what I saw, what I saw, you will never believe me. Mary screamed hysterically, Charlotte, I saw Charlotte, I think it was Charlotte, and I saw, I, I don't know what I saw, Mary said, bursting into her mother's home, not making any sense, Mary, Mary, calm down, just calm down, I was sensing something off what happened, the energy in the air warmed me, I could feel it. Just calm yourself and tell me what's happened. Are you hurt? Is Charlotte okay? Eliza asked, sitting her frantic daughter down. It was a mistake. I don't know why I believed him. He always does this. He draws me in with promises of our daughter and makes me do stupid things, mother. Stupid things that I end up regretting. And what I've done now is unforgivable. Mary half explained. What what did you do? And who drew you in? What happened? The hermit woman of Good Island said demanding more information. <clears throat> Jacob, he told me he'd finally give me more access to our daughter if I Mary paused. It was as if her lips and tongue could not form the words of the horror she unleashed on Terramore House at the wedding. But Eliza was no fool. She could sense something awful, and she could tell in Mary's disappearance that he, she had been in hiding all night from some 
something, something horrible. Please tell me, no one got hurt because of something Jacob made me do, Mary. Please tell me. Elizabeth opened the page of her book she saw to Everlasting Life was only a coincidence. I killed him. I'm so sorry. I must have been out of my mind. He was dangling Charlotte in front of me like a carrot on a stick. I was out of my mind, Mary screamed. Oh my God, you killed Jacob, Eliza asked, misunderstanding. No, no, he lives. Jacob, Mary paused, unable to say what she did. Mary, you need to tell me what you did. Speak, girl. Eliza shaking her distraught daughter. Mary's eyes filled with tears as she slowly pulled out Jacob's revolver from inside a hidden pocket of her skirt and mud stained dress. Eliza gasped and quickly grabbed the gun, rushing it to a drawer and a side table in the kitchen and slammed it shut, her heart racing with panic. Jacob had me kill Sebastian Lord at the wedding, Mother. I was supposed to do the same to Evie, his new wife, but I missed. I I am a murderer, Mary explained, breaking down completely and burying her face in her mother's chest, sobbing into the delicate lace. As the two good women discussed the murder, Constable Christ, Christian Evans and his friend Philippe Braga, who would often act as deputy, rowed their small boat up to Good Island shore and tied off the rope around a wooden stack, carefully making sure it was snug in its slip. Philippe turned to see the thick wilderness of the tiny island and noticed the smoky trail in the air from Eliza's chimney swirling up in the sky. How does she live here all alone, Philippe wondered. It's quiet. It's just her. No one from mainland, Maine, or Welshport come out to bother her. It's almost perfect. I can see the appeal, Christian said, as he tied the knot on the boat's rope. Perfect? For hiding people, Philippe noticed. Exactly, Christian agreed. The fog began to settle lower on the small island, causing the green of the trees to turn gray and cold. Philippe turned to the sea and saw the larger island of Welshport in the distance, also dressed in its foggy cloak, only breaking his concentration as a murder of crows began flight from inside the forest like a gaggle of banshees screaming into the sky. Look, Philippe said, noticing a small boat tied to a dock just on shore. Chris, Christian nodded. They both knew it had to be Mary's boat. As the two got onto shore, they lifted their eyes to the sky and saw a billowing pile of white stuff rising from the thicket of the trees in the distance. All of the smoke, Christian said as he pointed to Eliza's house. Mary has got to be there. <clears throat> Back in the cottage, Eliza tried as best she could to console her daughter, Mary, but the young manipulated woman was too far gone. Then as the tea cold in their mugs on a small table in the front room, Christian Filippi knocked on the cabin door. Mary and Eliza jumped. Shh, Eliza said, hushing her trembling daughter. Eliza, good, open the door. This is Constable Evans of Welshport. We need to speak with you, Christian said at the door, as Philippe tried to look through the windows. There were two obscure by trees and brush. Quickly, Eliza said in a hushed voice as she pulled her daughter over to a large rug. 
in the floor that she pulled up and revealed a small secret passage under the cottage. She quietly lifted the passage lid and pulled Mary's hand, leading her down into the hiding bunker. Eliza put her finger to her lips, telling Mary to be quiet, to keep quiet, close the lid, replace the rug, and composed herself as Christian knocking got louder. Constable, what is it? Eliza asked when she opened the door, fluffing her long gray hair. Can we come in? Christian asked. Eliza looked over and saw Philippe too. I'm a very private person, sir. Whatever you need, I think we can handle this at the door. Please, Eliza requested, crossing her arms. We need to come in. We have reason to believe that your daughter, Mary, is here. And we need to talk to her, Christian asserted. Mary, Mary lives on the big island. She doesn't stay here. I haven't seen her in a very long time. Who would, who'd want to live here now at a day's Eliza lied? Can I check to be sure? I'd like to report back to the Lord family that indeed she's not here, Christian said. The Lord family? What would they have to do with Mary? What is this? Christian wasn't sure if she could, if he could tell that a, Eliza what Mary was suspected of doing, but it came out anyway. We think she killed someone, Sebastian Moore. Think, Eliza asked. Well, as the law goes, madam, innocent until proven guilty, but I saw her with my own eyes, Christian replied. Eliza had to play dumb. She gasped at her, held her chest. Sorry, and held her chest. She shook her head and even managed to cry one solid tear. Her performance was perfect. I'll need to check, Christian said again. Fine, but just you, she said. Christian turned to Philip, who nodded back, agreeing to wait outside. Christian entered the small home. And look, look towards the back room. He walked back into the front room where the fire was raging, warming both their bodies. He scanned for any sign of Mary. All the while, she waited under the house as the thuds of Christian's footsteps pounded in unseen with the beating of her terrified heart. As Christian was able to leave, was about to leave, he noticed two mugs of tea on the table. He turned around to look at Eliza, who suddenly opened the palm of her hand and blew a dusty substance in his face. She grabbed the mug and hit it when Christian shook off the dust that was blown into his face. He had this strange feeling coming over him like warm water flowing over his whole body. Ugh. Christian said, unsure what he was about to say. Yes, Eliza prodded, hoping the dust she blew worked. Um, I, I wanted to. Miss Good, if you see Mary, please tell her to come back to the big island. It's for her own good, Christian said, ever noticing he had forgotten about the second mug and the dust that he had be. That had bewitched him. Christian took one more look at the front room. Then he left, leaving Eliza breathing heavily and relieved. Philippe was surprised when Christian came out of the cottage without Mary in a headlock. He believed Mary was there hiding. Now free from her secret passage, Mary hugged her mother tightly. What did I do? What can I do, she asked. This was a death that was brought on by pure evil and manipulated words. You were coerced, my child, and my book warned me of this was to come, Eliza said, reaching for open book on a <clears throat> the open book on a back table. What do you mean? Mary asked. 
Look then, when you threw the book of spells the other day, you were angry at me, it fell open on this page. Life everlasting, it was a sign, Mary. Something that I was being warned of, Eliza explained. Then Mary paused, letting it all sink in slowly. Mother, are you telling me what I think you're telling me? You can bring Sebastian back with this? Reverse the horror I've caused, Mary asked. Eliza paused before answering. She knew that the spell in the book was powerful and that eventually would be consequences for it, for this spell was not meant to bring back human life, but it might work in the right hands. I'll try, Eliza said. The elder woman <clears throat> went over to a small cup just beyond the kitchen door with two chickens that had yeah, with two chickens she had roasting. She opened the hutch and removed one of the chickens that wiggled and scratched in her hands. Mary watched, even then went to an open area in front of the fireplace in the front room and fell to her knees. She reached into the fire with one hand, and a chicken tucked under her arms and pulled out Carchel, where she proceeded to draw a circle on her wooden floor. She placed Mary's empty mug of tea that had hidden from Christian in the center of the draw circle and closed her eyes. Mary watched as her mother, kneeling in the glowing red and yellow light of the fire, began to hum in Latin. The humming grew louder and louder. Eliza then removed the squirming chicken from under her arm and lifted it with both hands over the mug. And suddenly, with quick motion, Eliza turned the chicken on its side and bit its head off allowing the blood to flow into the mug like a running stream of red. Mary gasped in horror, never seen her mother do such a thing. A cold wind blew into the cabin. As Eliza lifted the chicken's body and head up into the emptiness of the air and began to chant in Latin again over and over until a wild wind burst through the kitchen window, ripping through the shutters and blowing into Eliza's hair. She chanted, Vatum internum signus et carnis I cannot read that, so I'm all probably butchering this. Um, <laughs> Mary began crying, her heart sinking into her stomach with fright. Eliza when in her hair chanted her Latin spell as chicken blood oozed down her arm. Finally, she opened eyes and the wind miraculously stopped. It's done, she said. Mother, what was? Mary began to ask through a choked voice before being interrupted by her sorceress mother. Go. Go to Sebastian's grave quickly. Bring his body back here, she ordered. His body? Mary asked, shocked at the request. Go, Mary. He will need us now. Eliza replied in a fervor, but Mary was frozen in her stance. Eliza got up, chicken blood dribbling from her lips, and screamed at her daughter, Go! Mary turned and ran for the door frantically with her instructions ready to bring back Sebastian's body to Good Island. As what had just happened quickly filtered into her brain, she knew not what she would find once his grave was open. But now she hoped her mother's spell worked and prayed all the way to St. Thomas cemently that Sebastian was alive. That evening, as the boats in Frenchman's Bay all came from to dock after roaming the seas, searching the large 
the large bounties of tuna through foggy New England. Seascapes, Rebecca sat in her room with the draped straw, and her maid, Georgina, at her side, pouring a glass of red wine. The wine swirled in the glass goblet with a golden rim as Rebecca lifted it to small and savor and fruit loose of grapes that made it. They should be here soon, Mama, Georgina said. Just as the maid lowered the jar of wine, the bedroom door opened, and in walked Evie, Jacob, and Gaspar. Evie looked around, her eyes readjusting to the darkness of the room. Gaspar smiled as he stepped aside, allowing Jacob and Evie to enter in further. Evie curtsied, and Jacob lowered his head to his mother. Rebecca, who stood up, you wanted to see us? Jacob asked. Please come in. All of you, Rebecca said as she moved from her soft chair to one of the four chairs that were placed around the circle table with a black velvet cloth co covering it. Please sit, she added. Evie looked up at Jacob and he shrugged his shoulders. The pair went and sat across from each other and Rebecca sat across the empty chair that Gaspar would occupy. Then Gasper lit two candles in the center of the table, allowing the dim light to sparkle in her eyes. What is this, Evie asked. Since our dear Sebastian's death, I have not been able to sleep. I have not been able to keep food in my stomach. I have not been able to get the image of his body being lowered into that coffin out of my mind. I have trusted so much of my spirituality into understanding that things awful and good happen, but not this. Sebastian was stolen from us, and my advisor Gaspar has told me that he can contact him, Rebecca explained. Contact him? Evie asked, confused. You don't mean Sebastian, she added. I do, Rebecca said as Jacob looked over at Gaspar's surprise. She was still taking his phony psychic abilities seriously. The two men continued to conspire against Rebecca, whose suspicious ways took over any superstitions and, and doubts she had of him. Miss Lord, Evie began, I have to unfortunately object to this. My husband's spirit should not be disturbed this way. Even if this were to actually work, I cannot allow it, Evie said, standing up. Mother, really, I have to agree with Evie here. This has gone too far. After all that our family has suffered over the years, especially since Sebastian's death, I think we should finally lay the rest all of this house, or sorry, hocus pocus. We we're so drawn to it, Jacob replied, annoying his mother. All of this hocus-pocus has gotten me through some of the darkest moments in my life. It is where I turn when I need guidance and peace and closure. Gasper understands. He is the one who helps me reach places I need when I need. Rebecca sternly explained to Jacob, who knew Gasper's psychic abilities were all a farce devised by Jacob to keep his mother and mind occupied while he attempted his many betrayals. <coughs> Gaspar turned and looked at Jacob, who turned and looked at Gaspar. Maybe this is our problem. Maybe we have allowed our matriarch to wade in the waters of the dead instead of staying in the world of the living. Perhaps this is why our family has suffered so much grief. When we play with fire, mother, we get burned. When we play with the dead, we die, Jacob said cryptically. Rebecca scoffed and rolled her eyes at her son, who was attempting to blame Rebecca's superstition lifestyle on all the horrible things that had happened to the Lord family, but she was as steadfast as anyone could be in her beliefs. Honestly, Miss Lord, I cannot participate in any of this, Evie said, changing the subject. Evangeline, I am not asking your permission to do this. I might 
have not been cleared, the seances for our family to find peace within the depth of our believed Sebastian. I need this. You need this. Please stay, Rebecca said. Evie took a deep breath. She could see in Rebecca the need for this, the need to try and see whatever could come from any attempt to reaching their beloved Sebastian, no matter how odd or dark it was. <clears throat> Georgina, nervous from all the ghost talk, shook in her shoes <clears throat> as she made eye contact <clears throat> with Gaspar, who only recently almost made her jump from a window to her death as he demonstrated a dangerous se session of hypnotic hypnotherapy on her. Gaspar remembered and smiled at her grimly and Georgina turned away. Miss Lord, please, you're an educated woman of great stature here. You cannot really believe that we will somehow contact my husband, and if we do, we what do we need from the poor soul? I would assume you would want him to rest in peace. I just can't do this, Evie said. If nothing comes of it, nothing comes of it, Evangeline. And if nothing happy, we will not speak of this again. However, Gaspar assures me, Sebastian will come, Rebecca insisted, then turned to Gaspar and coldly said, He owes me for the debt of the cards on the wedding day, Rebecca added, showing now she did not forget. He did not see Sebastian's death exactly as it happened in the terror reading. It's not like you have to get back to your art books, do you? Jacob replied sarcastically, showing his acquaintance to his mother's desire. Please, Miss Gasper said. Outnumbered now, Evie looked around the table and could not believe what she was being asked to do. She was a woman who had education and understood the world around her more than people gave her credit for. She came to the island a bride, a woman whose job it was to marry a man because it would help her family back in England, but she didn't want to feel as if she was a fool without a brain. The bizarre request to take part in the seance to reach her dead husband just felt ridiculous, especially just three days since his funeral, but Rebecca was instant insistent sorry she was the matriarch of the family she wanted this seance evie nodded her head in agreement and sat back down at the table please georgina will you step outside it's important they own those closest to sebastian and here in this room gasper asked if rebecca's maid who looked to her mistress for permission rebecca nodded for her to leave and she did so happily as they prepared the table on a quick aside jacob asked gasper and melinda in a whisper <clears throat> how do you manage her not question why you didn't see sebastian's death suspiciously you're as dense as they say, she believes in me, Jacob. All my readings have been vague for a reason. They said something was coming, something awful and low. I had no idea my guess would work so well. Prophecy complete. Casper whispered back smugly before reading into a large that black leather bag to pull out a stunning crystal ball to put into the center of the table in between the glowing candles. Gaspar then turned back to the others. Thank you all now. Let us join hands and close our eyes. As all eight of their lids closed, Rebecca pulled out the lock of hair tied with a ribbon that she had cut from Sebastian's head. Then she lay in his coffin and 
collapsed it between her hand and Evie. Evie could feel the thick tickle of the tiny hair she cracked by open and looked at her hand. Rebecca smiled and twisted her hand out from Evie's and showed her the lock. Evie smiled uncomfortably. The door to Rebecca's room was left a cracked open by Georgina. As she left, then it opened slowly. A little face appeared in the shadow. The open door, a little face that had blue eyes <clears throat> and bright blonde hair. The face of Charlotte who peeked in as the seance began. The candle's flame began to flicker as the light coldness blew into the room. The minuscule gust of ice air lifted the tiny hairs in Evie's neck. It knew against Rebecca's eyelashes and cold Jacob's lips. Gasper's crystal ball began to reflect the light of the candles, and he spoke. To the world under us, to the world below us, to the spirits among us who speak to me, only in my mind's eye and where the future is known, and the past forgotten, I ask you to bring forth the spirit of Sebastian Lord, as Gasper spoke in his fake French accent. Charlotte slowly made her way around the bedroom and hid by the bed. The flame of the candle in the center of the table began to sway in the non-existent breeze. Rebecca opened her eyes. Close your eyes, madam, gasped Bart. Evie felt uncomfortable. Her heart was beating faster and faster. As suddenly a cold wind of air brushed against the back of her neck that reached around and blew out the candle. Sebastian, Lord, are you there? Please, please let us see or hear or know you are with us, Gasper asked. I feel him. I feel something, Rebecca said. The same when Evie did, but the ghost in the room was not Sebastian. It was the ghost of Sabrina Lord, the drowned mother of Sebastian. It was dwelling in the body of little Charlotte. She was in the room. She was the cold air. She was the unseen spirit that they were all feeling. She was there to show herself in a way that had never they had never expected. The spirit of Sabrina, now out of Charlotte, floated like a blue light with Sabrina's face over the floor. Someone's eyes were closed, but the cold air was in the room. So cold they could see their own breath. Cold, Jacob said, feeling a bit unsettled. I want to stop. I want to stop, Evie yelled, unable to release her hand from Rebecca's and Gaspar's equal grasp. Circling the group, Sabrina's slowing body created a vortex of cold air. Her aura was cooling their bodies like an ice-cold wind of the Atlantic. This was meant to freeze all it touched. A sound of ghostly wind began to be audible. They could hear it in their air hurt in the air, their ears. Feel the cool air on their skin. It was like they were outside performing the sounds. Gasper was frightened. He had no idea it was going to happen. At most, he thought he'd bump the table with his knees, but to his surprise, something ghostly did appear, but on his own, not with his fake powers. On its own, sorry, not with his fake powers. Sebastian, tell us. Tell us where we if you're well, tell us if you need to do something and how we should avenge your death. Tell us, please. Show us in our minds, Gasper said as he began to speak to the ghost. But the ghost, Sabrina, was not amused. She was furious with the man who murdered her, furious with the man who turned a blind eye to him, and furious with the man mocking the dead. With a giant gust of power, Sabrina swore one more time around the group. Cowering in the corner, Charlotte watched, and then, when she knew it would happen, she put her hand in her lap, and Sabrina's ghost drove itself into Gasper, knocking him out of the chair and clear across the room, and entered Charlotte again. The table 
flipped the candle, hit the floor, and went out, allowing the melting wax pool and quickly hardening in the cold air. Rebecca screamed, Evie gasped in deer and quickly stood up. Jacob, too, jumped out of his chair and rushed over to a disoriented Gasper. Charlotte, now possessed again by Sabrina, quickly left the room before being noticed. He was here. He was here, Rebecca said, left in a room with the two lambs in the corner. It can't be. It's impossible, Evie said, standing back from the group as if they did had some kind of disease that she wanted to to no, no part of. You witnessed it yourself, my dear. Sebastian was here, Rebecca replied. But what was his message? What the devil did he want us to know with that? Jacob wondered as he helped Gasper up from the ground. He is angry. He is wanting to cause any kind of chaos because of his own death. This is the way of the spirit world. He will lash out until he can finally come to terms with his murder, Gasper said. I want nothing to do with this. I'm going back to my room, Evie said, being pulled by the hand of Rebecca. My darling, you must come to terms with this. Death, just as we have. This will not be the last time we try to contact him, and we need you to be here when we try again. You must, Rebecca said. Why can't you? see that this is just all oh, it's not right whatever happened here whatever we felt was not sebastian it couldn't be he he wouldn't do this hurt one of us i just can't believe that evie said the logical side of her brain trying to make sense of what she felt the sensation of the coldness and the sensation that indeed there was something there with them something from a different world that her own brain and her own senses seemed to try and betray her beliefs in a logic and common sense. Rebecca could see how disturbed by the whole event Evie was. It was understandable, after all. It was her first seance. She grabbed her hand and changed from holding it tight to keep her in the room, to bundling it between her two hands to comfort her. Clearly, he is trying to tell us we've done something wrong. We need to atone. We need to make it right for our dear boy, Rebecca said. I don't understand. I don't know what I felt. I just, I want to go back to my room now, Evie demanded. I'll walk you back to your room, Rebecca said, realizing perhaps it was too much to sin. Now alone, Gasper straightened his coat and looked up at, Jake, at Jacob dead in the eye. His face was pale, and his skin clumsy and slick with sweat. How did that happen? Gasper asked again, switching to his natural British accent from his fake at French one. What do you mean? Jacob wondered. Do you think I could shoot myself out of my chair and across the bloody room? Jacob, what was that? That wasn't me, Gasper shouted. Jacob stood there in silence, but said not a single word, while realizing there was something truly dark that came into that room for this split second. Help me straighten up, Jacob said, leaving Gasper shaking in his shoes and looking and wondering just what in the world they had opened. A deep white fog roamed the streets of it of the village like a slow lonely sailor searching for his lost love the gas lamps and town town glowed in with halos around their glass lampshades while sleepless seagulls swirled above in full shipyard and marina through the cobblestone streets past the various late night pubs and bars where a small cottage filled with quaint fur furniture where Celeste and Philippe lived. It was late and Celeste sat back in her chair after a day of baking. She slipped from a glass, or sorry, sipped from a glass of brandy just as Philippe stepped into the room with, after a warm bath. His golden skin still glistened in the light of the room. He walked over to her and knelt down, kissing her 
lips as she smiled. She kissed him back. What was that for, Celeste asked. It's been a long day, Philippe said as he put on a French pair of clothes. You're getting dressed, Celeste then asked, confused that he hasn't been putting in his regular night clothes, but day clothes. I went with, I went with Christian to Good Island today to search for Mary. Her mother kind of gave us the runaround. She seemed off to me, but Christian believes Mary isn't really there. Philippe explained, buttoning up his white shirt and attaching his suspenders to his trousers. So, what? where do you think she is, Celeste asked. After another sip, good island, he replied. I'm confused. You just said that Eliza told you she wasn't there. Has anyone checked her apartment above the flower shop here in town? Celeste wondered. We did, but Eliza wasn't telling the truth. There's no way in hell Mary Good is here on the big island. We've searched everywhere, and we haven't found one bit of evidence that she's here. Her mother is hiding her, Philippe said. I still don't understand why you're, tell why you're getting dressed, Celeste said. Sebastian used to be one of my best friends. We are so close, I cannot tell you. I cannot just let his murderer go free like this. I'm going back to Good Island, and I'm going to find Mary and bring her to Christian. Philippe said as he tied his last shoe. Philippe, are you going mad? You cannot go there alone. We have all heard the strange things that have happened out there. Eliza is... There is something strange about that woman. You saw her. You saw her where she lives. Tell me you didn't feel a bit off when setting foot on her little haven. It's too dangerous, Celeste shouted. shouted sir. I'm going, and I'll be fine. Trust me, please. Please, Philippe said, holding his partner by the shoulders as he leaned down and kissed her again. Celeste mourned instantly to his touch, but quickly cold. Once his lips left her hers, I just can't sit there and let you put yourself in danger like this. I'm going with you, she said as she reached for her coat that was hanging on a coat and her nearest to the door. Absolutely not. Stay here. I need you to be here and let Christian know where I've gone. If something does happen to me, do you understand? He asked. Celeste replaced her coat. She knew he was right, but she still didn't feel good about it. He kissed her again, grabbed his hat, clothes, and coat, and left. Philippe rode his small boat to shore on Good Island, through calm ocean waters that kissed the bow and stern softly. There was a slow current now that all the other larger ships had docked near the mainland. His was the only boat now at sea guided by a large lighthouse over at Lighthouse Point. With each flash of light from the southern tip of land off the big island of Welshport Fleet made his way to Good Island. Just of his journey was second nature to him. Upon his arrival, Philippe tied the boat to the same stump he had and Christian had earlier. He and Christian, sorry, had had earlier that day and slowly made his way from the beach to the woods that would direct him to Good Island. Sorry, to good, the Good Family Cottage. The woods that surrounded the small and only house on the island were thick and wild. Philippe could barely see where he was going, but the light of the lighthouse from Welshport could still flash his way about halfway into the forest. He carefully took steps through the thick brush and tried to remember directions to the small house for, from earlier that day when they used to, the smoke of the chimney for directions, but on this night there was no smoke. There were sounds that frightened Philippe, strange restless and leaves and shadows and branches of the trees. A wolf howled off in the distance and 
as he growled without showing itself. He turned to see only smoke, lit fog, laughing from the coal ground of the f forest. Soon the light of the lighthouse was gone, and he could only depend on the dim light of the moon to light his way. And finally he came to the cottage as he could see the little house lit up in the distance with a small glow of the candlelight shining through a tiny front window. Fleet made his way to the cottage, quiet as it was, he could sense a strangeness all around him. The wolf again back in the distance howled. A chill ran up Fleet's back as she crept around the small cottage hoping to gain access and catch Mary and Eliza in their lie. As he did, so he came across a strange large cage in the back of the cottage just off the back porch, feet from the kitchen. The cage was laid with bars from the top of the ceiling to the floor. It was a chicken coop. He looked inside and saw just straw on across the floor, a large empty pail and a silver metal fashioned dish tossed it in the corner. Sleep carefully inspected the oddly large cage, when suddenly he turned to find Eliza standing before him, all in white with strips of blood going down the front of her nightgown, her face frozen with anger in her eyes, piercing Philip with a death stare that startled him so much he yelped like a child. She lifted her hands that were covered in chicken blood and collapsed around the handle of the iron skillet that she then brought down on Philippe's head, knocking him unconscious. Hours passed and Philippe woke to it, a bubbling sound from Eliza's stove. He rubbed a small bump on his head and tried to open his eyes. When he did, he saw himself locked up in the same cage at the back of the cottage. Philippe leapt to his feet, dizzying himself in the process. He shook the bars that were as tall as he was. The small area he was trapped in, filled with straw on the floor, was about the size of a normal-sized closet. The bars were made of iron, formed in a latest style cage. He shook the bars to free himself, but he was trapped. Then entered Eliza, her eyes smoky and dark. You come to scavenge like a pig for truffles? You'll be treated like a pig, Eliza said from behind her kitchen window that faced the pen. What do you want, she cried as she came out of the door with a bowl of warm blood. She has been stirring in the open stove. Philippe looked deep into her eyes and felt his heart skip a beat. There was truly much more evil in this little island than he had ever imagined, than anyone had ever imagined. So that's chapter nine. So I think I had said where was uh, at the end of chapter eight. I wonder where the gun went. Well, Mary still has the gun. Um, Mary still had the gun, um, which is interesting. So now her mother took it and like hit it. You have a, you had a seance. So where Rebecca, Evie, Gaspar, or Jacob were trying to contact the ghost of uh, Sebastian and they got the ghost of Sabrina. Now with Gaspar being like thrown by the ghost of Sabrina and I, I'm sort of wondering how scared, not just Gaspar, but Gaspar and Jacob, because you did this seance. And I mean, you, you look, you could go to Jacob could go to EB and like, can, like say shit all he wants. But now it's like, what do you do? You know, you, you can't, you've sort of put yourself in this corner. I'm curious to see like if they're going to try to pull something because you know, if you're gasp, like, hey, dude, I've helped you enough. I mean, you owe me money, but money ain't worth all this. Um, that, that would be me after I would get thrown out of a seat, um, especially by, you know, 
somebody wasn't there. That's crazy. I like how the seance was described. It was described very, very well. I like how the setting is always really good. I don't know if I have a favorite character. I think my favorite character is just the location and the process of it. It all just seemed really, you know, people often say, well, places are like characters. I think, to me, the best character so far has been Welshport itself, has been the place. It just, the, sure, the characters, the people in it make it go, but the place itself just adds its own lore, um, which is good. So, along with Good Island, that, and I'm not punning that at all. Um, so, <laughs> what I'm most curious about, now, I have a guess here, and I don't want to, my guess is, and again, that Sebastian is going to become a vampire. That's my guess, um, which is interesting. Now, I'm curious to see, not just that, but. What will happen with Sabrina's ghost, like with her and Charlotte? Because that's going to be interesting. Because here's Charlotte, here's Sabrina's ghost and Charlotte, who knows she knows who committed the murder. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. Link to chapter nine of To Be Night and Be All is in the description box. You guys have a good day.